Hello and welcome. The Blues are to unzip after round one. It still doesn't make any sense to me, but what a time to be alive. Yeah, footy's good when you win in Jono, so can't complain. A lot of shit wasn't working in this game. According to the MCG scoreboard, Tom DeConing plays for Richmond. Both teams couldn't kick for shit half the time, and Patrick Cripps apparently clocked a top speed 160 kilometers faster than the fastest land animal on earth. And that, my friends, caps off the perfect segue I'll ever get into my Carlton analysis for the week. Patrick Cripps and Tom DeConing as well. One man had a great all-round game against the Tigers. Tom DeConing not so much, but then the last quarter, of course, he turns it right on. Both at the centre of what happens to be a little early season issue, the stoppage game. This is what Michael Voss had to say about it. I mean, that, that's an unusual profile for us. I mean, we've we've kicked nine goals from, from transition. They were able to generate, you know, a, a pretty significant score from a source that we do very well at defending and also get a lot of um, assertiveness and territory from. This performance was off the back of a Richmond side having a diabolical showing of their own at the contest last game, with Brisbane giving Carlton similar treatment in the first half last week leading 26 to nil in points from stoppage in their early game surge. A team who was so strong at the contest last year, whilst negating the influence of oppositions in this area, are at the wrong end of a new trend. Is there something beyond the surface? Let's understand it. Before we begin, I do have a channel membership set up if you want to support the channel financially. If you'd like to support, make sure to click the join button below if you would like to do so. No obligation, of course. Enjoy. I want to speak about Tom DeConing first. Obviously, it doesn't take many brain cells to understand he's athletic, and with athleticism, you compromise a bit of strength, a stronger base. In this game, I felt as if DeConing's mobility and athleticism was well counteracted with Nankervis's strong base. I didn't feel like DeConing was assertive enough around the ground as well to make up for those issues earlier on and utilize his mobility. Though the last quarter came round and we absolutely saw DeConing's effectiveness when he is embracing the number one best ruck on the ground role. Here's something that mainstream media did not pick up. Nankervis played 87% game time in the third, but Tom DeConing is at the bottom of the list. Out of every humanely possible player playing in the third, injuries and subs aside, he played the least at 65% unintentionally as the ball was stuck on the outer side. Did his drastic influence on the game arise because of that long stint where he was stranded on the bench? He exuded energy in the last and it displayed in his play both at the contest and in his around the ground play. The dynamic of the Ruck matchup throughout the game is embodied through this quote. Let's take a listen. It was a good battle, wasn't it? Because yeah. I thought Nan Kervis was strong for the Tigers. His first half was really, really good. Did a lot of clearance work himself. But you could see De Koning just still covering the ground. He's a, he's a young athlete that's only going to get better, we suspect. And he did a couple of really important things. Whilst Nan Kervis didn't necessarily have a bad showing by any stretch in the last quarter, you look at De Koning's impact quarter by quarter in the second half, and it could not be any more lopsided. And then you compare the stat lines for Carlton, generally speaking, in the third quarter, and some of their pitfalls when it came to stoppages. You come to realize that for the responsibility he holds, Tom De Koning is incredibly important. I want to point out a few examples in this last quarter. This kick by McGovern is a great one to De Koning. It's on De Koning's right side, and Nankervis is on his left side thus causing Nankervis to infringe and give away the free kick. Irrespective of what happens in the forward 50, it results in that forward 50 entry, which leads to a free kick being given away. De Koning won two of his three free kicks in the last quarter, as opposed to the first half where he gave two frees away. This was a sign of who was higher up on the ledger in the last. This was so important as it leads to a 12 point swing. When you consider Lynch's shot at one end, and then Owies on the other side converting. But note this key stat. Carlton's goal through Matt Owies was Carlton's second goal via a kick-in chain. Aside from that goal and another kick-in which led to a goal early on, 22 defensive 50 chains had led to three inside 50s. Carlton weren't too successful in this regard, 
So consider this turning glitter into gold. Then here, the Blues have gotten the ball out of their back 50. And how important for De Koning, after being removed from the initial landing zone, to come across and basically serve as an extra mid. Pickett was looking for the space to move into where there's numbers either sitting back or running through. He dawdles and probably underestimates that ability by De Koning prevents the re-entry. Now, De Koning's goal actually stems from the free he won courtesy of that tackle. De Koning is facing a similar situation to Nankervis here. He's here, and Nankervis is setting up behind the ball. Nankervis, after the Blues get the ball back, having needed to recover from a turnover down the line, does the right thing setting up similarly. De Koning is doing the same in the case the Tigers get the exit, and Nankervis takes the mark with De Koning working smarter not harder. Bolton looks inside, but takes on the shorter, wider option with De Koning holding the Tigers up. This is a decent option by the Tigers because it would have opened the ground up. That is if De Koning hadn't stayed back the entire time to get this mark and then win that 50 meter penalty. And even when De Koning wasn't winning the hitouts, he was doing this sort of follow-up, locking up Nankervis in a tackle. All game long, De Koning had actually been playing behind Nankervis, which I understand because he wants a bigger run-up to tower over. But Nankervis is smart. He can block those runs by sticking an arm out and killing off that momentum that comes with a leap. In this case, De Koning does take that front position, but a lot of times in this game, Ruck taps where he should have capitalized weren't all that controlled. I would have liked to see him be a bit better in this regard, just to softly knock it down because there was space to drop it into on this play. Instead, Taranto wins it, but then you can see both Nankervis and TDK walking, but one with that bit extra in the tank, as we mentioned earlier. The Blues convert a turnover into some great defensive work to keep it confined, and you wouldn't believe what that caused. Our first stoppage goal of the game as congestion grew. And I know this is unrelated, but this is what I also noticed a couple of times. I found it very interesting Harry would sometimes take the forward 50 ruck work at stages with De Koning standing about 10 meters away. I would have thought lining the 50 meter line would be a good idea for any clearing kick with the thought of sending it back in and getting that re-entry. Overall, not only was De Koning enabling improvement from stoppages, but was also feeding into our turnover game on multiple occasions. And this is the deconing that allows the Blues to level up and have a higher ceiling. This leads me onto the next player on the agenda, Patrick Cripps. And we'll start at where we ended the deconing segment. Carlton in the fourth quarter won the contested possession count by nine on a night where they were getting dominated in that area. And Adam Chera's goal was the first from stoppage. It's only fitting that Patrick Cripp started it off. You'll notice Cripper actually starts to the left of Nankervis, but shuffles across in front at the last second, as it looks like he may body bump Nankervis. It actually is a trend for this whole sequence where that movement means Cripps takes the lead in this situation. First, shielding the space where the ball will drop. Then he's shielding the ball from Nankervis whilst it's on the ground, and then he's able to shovel it out to Fogarty who gives one further out to Chera. Those numbers are sucked into the contest whilst the Blues have found that space back of the stoppage simultaneously. It simply does not happen if Cripps doesn't give himself the upper hand early on at the start of the ball up. Now, Cripps did have an influence on the contested side. Don't get me wrong. Winning 22 contested possessions, 15 more than the next best Carlton mid. Crucial in a game where you're outdone by 11 in this area. He's so important, but Cripper went against that contested bull trait that he possesses early on, which was very much to Carlton's benefit, a welcome surprise. Whilst having run 22 Ks in half a quarter was a typo, he did run incredibly hard as he displayed his aerobic capacity and game awareness. Let's listen to something that was said from a Tigers viewpoint at halftime. And, and Darren speed doesn't mean it's uh, risky. It actually becomes a bit more predictable to, to teammates up the ground. So if that's your brand of football and you want to play in one side out the other, a bit of sort of run and gun, 
at least the players up the ground know you're going to do that. And whilst we definitely did see some dare and speed in Carlton's game, it didn't really involve any risk or complication. With a player like Cripps simplifying yet enhancing our play. Let's take a look. You can see here Nankervis wins clearance with a disadvantaged center bounce for the Blues, yet Cripps follows it. And when Newman smothers the ball, and the Blues evidently are looking to capitalize off of turnover, Cripps promotes the transition play with a straight line run through the middle of the ground. He has a chance to get it once, doesn't, but persists. And ultimately, he's used the second time. The inefficiency means he comes up empty, but you would like one of the key forwards to come forward. They're just a little segregated from Cripps. Even though he makes the distance, you've got a lot of space and you're asking a lot of him to have to kick it this far with minimal margin for error. Here's our first goal from kick-in where Cripper is at the drop of the football. The fact the ball is here enables the quick give to Cripps, which then goes on to suck in a number of Tigers as the ball gets through. Notice here on multiple occasions, the Blues only half turn. They don't waste time fully swiveling on a hand pass because runners are supporting. Having Cripps as an option means Cunners could basically give and go because now freed of the ball, Cripps serves as a decoy and that creates an opening, ton of space going forward. This kick to Harry is what I wanted on the previous play we watched. Here you'll notice Cripps in the rough contest. As soon as the contest occurs, whilst Bolter is athletic, he doesn't go with Cripps, who is getting to the next contest. He's unattended for ages, having absolutely killed his direct opponent for work rate, and is used crucially, although I feel he overused it on this occasion for all the time he had. And this had Richmond in disarray. Carlton's midfield was working significantly harder in their transition forward, and it was working an absolute treat. This is what Jack Rewalt had to say about what Patrick Cripps was doing. And about back six, it's it's a back seven there. That's on the midfield as well. Cripps is the one that's getting forward. Hewitt's the one that's getting forward. Yeah. It's really important on well, the it's midfield. On all, it's on all of Richmond. It did feel at times that that TDK to Cripper chemistry was lacking a little. Either Richmond were reading the tap work better. Sometimes Cripper had that attention on him, Sometimes the knockdown was misdirected. And this small margin for error, mixed in with the Tigers being switched on, meant they were converting deconing tap downs to clearances, whilst Patrick Cripps wasn't really involved. This is what I mentioned about that last year. You see, Carlton opponents play to what Cripps does. They may let him get it, but their sole responsibility is to deny him from having a further impact, which Richmond did well. You see here, the deconing knockdown to Cripps is accurate yet fumbled. It remains tightly contested, but the Tigers were able to get their arms free for the pressure present, though the Blues held firm on this occasion. But whilst there definitely were some shortcomings, there were some more positives that seeped in later on in this regard, regarding that connection, yet Richmond still found a way to not let up. This is a sublime knockdown to Cripps, perfect stoppage play late in the quarter. Just a shame Carroll's right-footed kick doesn't exist in his arsenal yet. 15 seconds later, it's a great deconing to Cripps win, although Hopper is right on Cripps' doorstep, and it ends up in Richmond's lap as they win another Clearance. So whilst clearance numbers would suggest that Richmond had the upper hand, Carlton were giving themselves opportunities. They had these moments where they would come close, but Richmond would be able to wrestle it back. And I think we need to give Richmond some credit for that, where credit is due. Now back to the fourth. This is what the Fox analysts said at three quarter time. You're starting to look at Carlton's midfield now and say, okay, where's the response going to come from? You've been challenged head on. And it's fair to say that as Carlton held on to a lead for dear life, it required game-winning plays of a contested nature. And Paddy Cripps delivered in this respect. Let's take a look. Here, Cripps wins the tap to himself and is able to feed the clearance, then rolls up as the ball goes back the other way, closing Vloston down and forcing him to lack direction with this kick. Then here, you love how he just doesn't give Hopper a sniff to get any territory gain. The Blues get lucky with the bounce as Cripper can protect where it's headed. Hopper has to go through Cripps to win it, 
and due to this he is not allowed any form of possession. Then the very next sequence, Harold does an excellent job against two tigers and grips with that physique can just ride the tackle, get the arms free, hand it to Hewitt and with 90 seconds on the clock this enables Carlton to possess severe leverage over the result with Richmond running out of time and the Blues a long way from their last defensive line. Important little moments by Cripps which are of value. Let's go back to 2023 me to hear some closing thoughts about Cripps which I think still hold very true. So look if I had to give an answer to the question how important is Patrick Cripps actually? Well, he's basically the lifeblood of Carlton's system and is of a mold all midfields need. He is the face of a team who prides themselves off of contested footy because he is contested footy personified. So it's clear that Paddy Cripps did more than enough in the middle to aid the Blues and it feels as if Tom DeConing's best elevates Carlton's ceiling tremendously. But is Tom DeConing to be relied upon to play that fourth quarter football more often than not? As I did with my preferred ruck combination weeks ago, David King is asking similar questions. So do they need pit net? Do they need a change in the ruck? Do they need something different around clearance? Because they, they were awesome last year. Time will tell, but as far as this game goes, when we demanded a gritty performance from our key players such as Cripps and a big last quarter from our ruckman, Tom DeConing, we got it. Without those two, the Blues do not win this game. And whilst the Blues are searching for a remedy to recapture their 2023 stoppage success they are just simply terrific in turnover and transition this year so far which signals future versatility in carlton's play and i can say this all whilst boasting that carlton are unbeaten what are your thoughts on the performances of de Koning and cripps and also carlton's early season stoppage concerns thanks for tuning in and we'll be back with another carlton analysis next week for the same game to look more at the game plan side of things with regards to what we've seen so far this year. What have we learnt so far this season from the Blues? Make sure to like and subscribe if you want to stay tuned. Have a great rest of your day. Stay safe, chat soon, and uh, bye for now.